there's been a lot of chatter, deservedly so, about what is going to happen with the new schedule starting in 2024, these designated no-cut events. I talked to Rory McIlroy yesterday. He said, yes, these designated events will have more FedEx Cup points up for grabs. We touched on this last night in live from. Do you have more details? I do. And again, we talked about this last night. And essentially, we knew coming into this that there was going to be more FedEx Cup points going to designated events. We knew that the winner of a designated event was going to get 700 points versus 500 points for a non-designated event. But I spoke with a player today who was at the meeting yesterday morning, got a little bit more detailed breakdown of what's being called a recommended points list. There you get an idea of exactly what the winners will get. And I think players kind of expected that going into this. Probably what they didn't expect, and again, talking with the player this morning, is if you look at the points all the way through the top 10 and the top 20, essentially it's going to be double the number of points that go to designated events versus non-designated events. Now to put that in context, if you were to finish solo fourth at a non-designated event, you're actually going to earn fewer points than a player who finishes 10th solo 10th at a designated event. Now, this is concerning for, to players for a couple of different reasons. Probably the primary reason is what they call churn. You and I yeah. have kind of talked about this. The PGA Tour, they've kind of pointed out that the, num the amount of churn that you get within the top 50 is somewhere between 40 and 60%. Essentially, what that means is about 25 players year over year fall out of that magical top 50 number. I think most players are okay with that number. As I've spoken with players about this new points distribution, there is a concern that that churn is going to be much, much lower. Now, you, you pointed out, you talked to Tiger Woods, and I've spoken with plenty of players who say that you need these elevated events to have more points. That's how you get the stars to play in them. There aren't any more mandatory uh, appearances that players have to go by anymore. You get bigger purses, you give out more points, and certainly I think most players understand that. The concern is you won't get that year-over-year turnover within the top 50. And it's interesting through the season, if you're in these non-designated events, in order for you to have a chance to get to the BMW Championship to finish top 50 in the FedEx Cup standings, which, by the way, makes you exempt into the next designated, all the designated events the following year, you first got to get to the top 70. Yeah. Uh, so it's going to be challenging for those players who aren't in these designated events to get to the top 70. I I'm interested to see once this is officially out, what the membership will have to say. Absolutely. Rex is always great stuff, and you can read Rex's material on golfchannel.com. Rich? All right, uh, Rex and Todd, Commissioner Jay Monahan, by the way, was uh, scheduled to be on set with us this evening. We were told, however, this afternoon he would be unavailable to speak to us. Disappointing, considering how much has changed in the game in the last 12 months. Uh, Brandel, big picture, you have some concerns. What are they? Look, the PGA Tour is a membership organization. Uh, they pride themselves on saying that quite often. And when a membership organization is going under such radical changes, uh, it seems obvious that there needs to be some give and take amongst, amongst all of the members. Now, it's easy to see where the give and take is among the rank and file members on the PGA Tour, but with the mandates being overturned uh, for the designated events and for the three non-designated events as it relates to the stars, I fail to see where the concessions are that the stars are making for the betterment of the tour. They want to be paid sort of along the lines of NFL or NBA players. They want to be paid like Patrick Mahomes or Aaron Rodgers. But you just think about this. Let's, let's spit out some numbers here. The NFL media right fees for one year are $11 billion. For 2023, they're $11 billion. For the NBA, they're $2.6 billion for 2023. Now, I know that there's owners, so the players only receive half of those fees. But when you consider that the entire media rights for the PGA Tour for one year, without the majors included, is $300 million, you throw in the majors and it's another $300 million, so you're talking about $600 million, that is nowhere close to $2.6 billion, or half of that, or $11 billion, or half of that. And yet, they want to be paid in that in that in that level and you think well okay if the if the fees the media fees don't justify it and the ratings don't justify it and that the premier players the star players are not going to acquiesce to the mandates and they're going to push away from it it just doesn't seem to me paul like it's sustainable it seems like you need a buy-in from the players first first and foremost if all of the sporting uh options are being challenged by all of the alternatives to attention now more than ever the stars need to come together on the pga tour and buy in fully and commit to these mandates imagine being a sponsor and not being told 
before the event, until two days before the event, what you've paid for. So they're not even, as far as I know, buying into changing a tour commitment deadline, which just comes two, three days before the event. So it just seems to me like this, everybody else is bending over backwards to make this a better product to compete on the stage, except for the concessions needed from the stars. You know, having sat on the, on the board of the European Tour for the last six years and, and sat with all these clever businessmen and women and, and, and listened uh, to the business of golf, you know, and I've got a kind of a 360 view of the game from, from being a player to obviously being involved in Ryder Cup um, to being sitting on the board and the business of it and now seeing it through TV and, and the demands of TV people. I've got a kind of a 360 helicopter view over the, over the business of golf, if we want to call it that. And you make some really, really valid points. And, and sustainability is always something that we were very concerned about on the European tour and, and very worried about. And, you know, particularly when COVID hit, we didn't put out the huge prize funds because we understood that we had to live and, and, uh, within our means and, and have cash flow. So I think it's really, really important that... Uh, the, the, the sport doesn't overreach itself. Granted, pay all of this money as long as the money is coming in. Now, what I will qualify that with uh, is that, you know, having sat with these people on the boards and not on the, on the PGA Tour board, but on the European Tour board that's, that's obviously closely, uh, closely aligned now, um, these people are not stupid and, and they're very, very clever business people. And, and if they feel that these funds are, 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 are um, achievable, um, that we are now entering into in terms of prize funds and that the business can sustain it, I really trust that that is the case in there. But back to your point and the one you handed it over to me, which I completely agree with, and I do have a concern about the fact that there is no mandate and the fact that these designated events next year, the players can play them if they want. Now, it sounds huge at $20 million, and to us it's all huge, but, you know, these players are becoming inc so incredibly wealthy, and often they will prioritise, oh, you know what, I don't want to play this week, it suits me for a family reason, or I've got this issue, or I've got that issue, um, and they might just pull out of it. And that is going to undermine the whole business of what the tour and the executive are trying to do here. And it really concerns me, and, and the point I made the other night as well too, which also concerns me, is the top players in the world now play less than players of previous eras. So, um, you know, it's very hard to sell a sport when your, your stars are playing less and less. With travel so easy now, and every single one of these top 10 players in the world, and go down even further, all fly privately to these events, and a lot of these events are now in America and easy to get to. Um, you know, it really is a concern for me that, they're, you know, they, they don't dismiss the business side of the game and they turn up and they promote and treat the tour like they should do. They're, it's a member's organization. They own it. Jay Monaghan doesn't own it. The board doesn't own it. TV companies don't own it. But if they want to improve that product and they want to keep these monies coming, they have got to contribute hugely to it. And it's not just by, by playing great golf. We know they're going to do that, but they've got to do another commercial ways too that's going to add revenue and potentially take those TV rights from 300 million to 500 million. Now you've got a proper thriving business, but it needs the top players in particular to really stand up now and, and, and you know, endorse um, the direction that the tour has given them. It'll continue to evolve, and this is so unusual because, as you know, Paul, the business of professional golf is under enormous pressure, and not from another business trying to disrupt, but from another, from, from a country, talking about Saudi Arabia, and the PGA Tour, the DP World Tour, their business has to, to use the business phrase, has to pencil. Saudi Arabia does not. They don't have return on investment concerns. They're not answering to shareholders or to board members or anything like that. Uh, and the tour's having to do it on the fly and in the public square. So um, I think they've, they've made some moves, got on their, as you like to say, on their front foot.